Welcome once again to the Altered Attitudes podcast, the podcast that delves into the realms of addiction recovery and the transformative journeys that lie within. Today, we have a conversation that is both incredibly inspiring and at times controversial, at least within the complex world of addiction recovery. In this episode, we're honoured to be joined by Luke Trainer, Programme Manager at Better Than Well, University of Birmingham. Better Than Well is a collegiate recovery programme, a recovery programme for students at the University of Birmingham. Although commonplace in the United States, Better Than Well is the first of its kind in Europe not only allowing for students to find recovery, but also conducting research that will go on to affect the way our country tackles addiction in the future. This episode is hosted by our very own Lester Morse with special guest, Luke Trey. Well, how are you, Luke? Uh, thanks very much for coming on to our uh, Awkward Attitudes podcast. Um, really excited to learn about your collegiate recovery programme. Um, but I thought it'd be great if we start off uh, getting a bit of information about you and your background and what led you to that point. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, no problems, Lester. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, you know, it can be a very long story, uh, as you know yourself, with with kind of experience, strength, and hope, and the like. You know, it can it can be uh, quite quite the journey. Uh, I'll kind of summarise mine as, as best as I can, you know, I'm from Birmingham, uh, grew up in Birmingham through the 80s and 90s with a lot of the, you know, social change that was occurring uh, in the city at that time. Came from a from a good household, you know, um, a large Victorian house in the south part of the city with three generations under one roof, a very, very busy household. A lot going on. Um, also had a, a grandfather who who lived with us, uh, who was a an alcoholic, you know, and he was he was in his own kind of version of I wouldn't call it recovery, but treatment. You know, he'd gone to the doctor with his alcoholism, and the doctor had given him benzodiazepines in order yeah. to 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 get off the alcohol. You know, through through the the um, kind of detox home detox model of the 1980s which just left you on valium for the rest of your life really <laughs> yeah. uh didn't didn't take me long to realize <clears throat> and strangely this is one of the parts of my own story i think that i find so perplexing and so baffling that um i must have experimented with my granddad's <clears throat> medication at the age of about 12 13 years old now that sometimes I suppose in addiction we hear stories that are, you know, sad, tragic, and baffling. But the image of a of a, a child of that age, and I do have you know boys of my own, and they are approaching that age. The idea that they would search around their uh, a family member's room and take tablets in order to alter their minds uh, mm. is is a is a sad and scary scenario but but you know i did that and and i found benzos around about the same time that um my elder brothers were kind of experimenting with uh cannabis and other substances i became very fascinated with that around about the same time as well um so there was a lot going on in their attic room of the house um that they occupied and it was kind of, you know, we're talking about um, 1991, 92 here. So the kind of birth of acid house kind of rave movement in, in, in the UK. Uh, so there was a lot of incredible kind of sounds coming from the attic. A lot of enticing aromas, different smells <laughs> that I'd never heard before. Herbal kind of aromas. And there were, you know, girls and stuff up and down the stairs at the weekend. I became, I think, obsessed with what went on up there long before I plucked up the courage to go up there. <clears throat> when I did go up there, it was everything that I hoped it would be and more. And um, I I managed to, I, I kind of realised that with the, the, the spliffs, you know, that they would go around the room in a communal way and that actually past a certain point in the evening, People didn't really care if they, who they were passing the spliff to. And, and me as a 12, 13 year old boy, positioned myself in the right place and 
got on onto the spliff. For me, you know, the sudden ease and comfort that came from that was instant. You know, um, all of the difficult feelings of not being quite right in this world, I guess what some people might call spiritual malady, um, they went in an instant for me when I, when I first used that substance, you know, and, and, and that propensity that I had towards delusion and fantasy in order to kind of get out of difficult situations or thoughts or feelings, you know, it did what I needed it to do um, from the very start. And not only that, it had it had with it all of this um, attached to it, a whole scene, um, music, connection with other people, fashion, all of these. It was it was a ready packaged thing for me. And I became very quickly obsessed with it. Um, and then, you know, thus begun the kind of the progression of of um, what I now today would consider, you know, a, a life limiting illness in, in my case. And, you know, some of that was was uh, I'm not going to lie, you know, it, there was magical connection uh, along the way, you know, um, and there was some experimentation that was was um, not wholly pathological. So, you know, experimenting with, 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 with certain substances meant that I, uh, you know, there were, there were different perceptions that, that were opened up in my experience. And actually some of the spiritual experience that I had later on in my life, I think was in some way flavored or at least seasoned by, um, by these kind of, some of these earlier experiences. But as we know, like any kind of uh, classic addiction story, the way that I used substances compared to my peers was markedly different from as early as 13, 14 years old. Um, I seem to be using substances in order to push away difficult experiences in my life. And certainly it would seem that I, um, once one substance went in me, I had a real physical difficulty in stopping that bout or binge of using even at a very young age you know that it would mean that you know during the kind of rave era uh, at the kind of after parties i'd be i'd be hoovering up speed until you know early monday morning um when other people were stopping and kind of thinking about going to college or part-time work in the morning you know I, I seemed incapable of being able to do that but genuinely when I look back at it now there was some physical force it seems that that, that um or lack of defense um that that I had um this went on um into you know all the formative parts of my life I think I had, I had an, an experience when I was 15, 16 years old, which at the time felt like a solution to the problem of addiction. But with hindsight, it was, I guess, my first real kind of step one experience. And that was that um, I fell in love with, with a girl and she, she was someone who was, uh, had, had great promise in her life. Someone who used to buy speed and uh, ecstasy off me actually uh, but she was a kind of a very you know she's probably the most desirable girl in the area and she was off to university and she was kind of always was going to do something with her life I was in a fair bit of trouble in Birmingham with other characters and and the police to a certain extent and so I just kind of clung onto her coattails and and went off to Glasgow where she was studying film and theatre didn't really do a great deal while I was there other than sell hash to her friends and, and, and the odd bit of ecstasy. But I felt like, um, you know, I felt like I've gotten away from addiction. I felt like this is the solution. You just uproot, move somewhere else, change your scene from kind of urban decay to a more bohemian drug scene, you know, more kind of red wine, hash, jazz music and just a different <laughs> setting and environment. Um, 
And you know what? For about four years, as long as her degree took, um, I managed to not use benzos, speed, and alcohol every day like I had been in Birmingham just to cope with existence. And there was something in the fact that um, there is a part, there is an element of uh, recovery that is about environment and is about social um, connections. But there was something very real lacking in that because when she got to the end of her degree, she, um, I can remember it very clearly. I said, so what are we, what's the, what's the plan now? What, what do we do? And she said, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to London to, uh, to further my career. I'm not sure what you're doing, Lou. And in that moment, the awful dread, the trauma of sorts, really, that, uh, she was leaving me and um, I really hadn't done much to kind of work on my own capital, my own social capital or, or, or anything like that. And so I went back to Birmingham and, and some of the friends that I'd left off from um, when, I, when I'd left to go, they'd moved on to different drugs and different ways of getting their drugs. So this was uh, crack cocaine and heroin. And I think on the first day or maybe the second day that I arrived back to Birmingham, I be I began to use heroin. And um, again, I had that, that kind of moment like in the attic with my brothers um, with with uh, cannabis when I first used heroin, you know, it, it, it did for me what I couldn't do for myself. It, it took away all of my, my my pain and suffering in that moment. And I became physically dependent really, really quickly. <clears throat> I always say that uh, heroin is, is, is powerlessness and crack cocaine is unmanageability. <laughs> so uh, with, with, with crack that came soon after, and that was a substance that, that just absolutely wreaked havoc in my life, brought me to my knees, changed my personality. Um, I became, you know, almost sociopathic on, on, um, on, on crack. And it would take me off on horrendous, baffling and, and terrible binges um, where I would, you know, really just step all over my moral and ethical life. There was no semblance of any morality uh, during those binges and heroin just kind of steadily was just always there, you know, whereas crack came in these punctuated, deadly binges, actually, and really just tore my life apart and the people around me as well. Just, you know, hor horrendous suffering uh, with friends and family. This this went on and, and, you know, there were periods, brief sometimes, slightly longer others, where I would seek some form of treatment, be that substitute prescribing or inpatient, NHS, private um, rehabs, you know, and, and I, could, I could stop actually uh, and with enough kind of, um, with enough, other stuff bearing down on me uh, I could stay stopped for a small time but I never really uh, managed to to stay stopped for very long this took me through all all different periods of my life it took me all over the world actually trying to trying to find treatment that might work for me um, I lived in in Thailand I went to a monastery called Wat Tham Krabak which has a a kind of now quite famous heroin detox program at the time it was very, um, it wasn't well known. And, you know, I spent um, about 12, 14 months on that monastery. And then as soon as I left, you know, relapse, 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 relapse. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the story of my uh, addiction in many ways. Um, I could just never stay stopped. I was in and around 12-step fellowship, so it wasn't that I was completely naive or ignorant to 12-step uh, recovery, but I never took it seriously. And I think um, there was a kind of atheism um, that, that really kept me believing that not only human power was, was um, enough to, uh, for me to keep the show on the road, um, but you know, some, some twisted belief in my own ability and ego really to, 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 to carry me through 
and it, and it caused havoc, absolute, you know, misery for the people around me. Um, you know, I could I could go on about it for a long, long time. There was there was all sorts of instances of um, of me actually pulling it back a bit and then bringing other people into my life. I worked in the NHS um, while I was, uh, you know, still on methadone and still using um, as a kind of almost a kind of drug worker, you know, deeply kind of dishonest in that I was um, offering people quite often harm reduction based advice, but also recovery based advice. And all the while I was I was using drugs myself and um, often using with the clients and service users as well. <laughs> so uh, all sorts of periods of, uh, of, 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 of kind of deep dishonesty, deep delusion and absolute degradation um, uh, with with addiction. I my period of recovery uh, began with, as it so often does, with uh, kind of catastrophic levels of uh, rock bottom and kind of ego death. Actually, um, you know, there wasn't there wasn't much left of me, and I I was kind of I was becoming just so utterly uncredible to the outside world that what semblance there was of a self or a me left was utterly dubious at best um i'd had my first child uh gabriel and his mother quite rightly had kept me at more than an arm's length distance but it allowed me into his life but only in a very uh safe and supported way uh but this had began to rip my heart out really because there was another thing in this world that was being affected um by by my addiction so so obviously and in such a kind of vulnerable way in such a you know such a pure thing being affected by my behavior i hadn't managed to stop for him and you'll often hear that with 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 people with addictions it is a fresh and new and novel look at what powerlessness actually is that you know what innate and intuitive uh, goodness we have left in us uh, really kind of clings on to the idea of I want to be a good father and you know quite rightly but the overpowering addiction is 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 a louder broadcast than that you know and that's mm. and that's how it was for me I um I began you know I I, I was more meaningfully going to 12-step meetings and I was starting to listen to what the people had to say in there and I was starting to recognize that 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 they were a lot like me and actually they had a solution in their life but i you know i was one of those people that just couldn't quite get it and i think actually my um my intellect got in the way i overthought the program i you know probably thought that i was special and different all of these things that we know are detrimental <laughs> to uh to accepting a new way of life and i was definitely like that and i'm i was a pain in the ass uh, to the old timers in, in, in most of the meetings that I ever stepped into, but they never stopped loving me and they never stopped being there for me. And they were always the people that I could go to um, when things had, had, had truly fallen apart around me. I also, um, while I was homeless, actually, because my addiction took me to, to you know, street homelessness, um, you know, destitution, complete divorce from from my community, family, and reality. Uh, but I, I kind of the drugs stopped working for me, Lester. Um, they just were no longer giving me the ease and comfort and doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And I started to look back to some of the other things in my life that had actually allowed me to get out of self as well. And I'd, I'd always been interested in in reading, philosophy, literature, art, music, uh, all of these things. So I, where I could, you know, I, I, I would try and learn and actually enrolled while I was homeless onto an access to a higher education course, completely um, manic for the most of that course. Um, I was, you know, speedballing 
in in the college, you know, uh, preparations of uh, IV, cocaine and heroin, which is a maddening process, which can leave you not really, you know, you don't know which way you're going to come out of a speedball. And I go into <laughs> classrooms in this state. Um, and, you know, the, the college called Faircroft were incredibly patient and tolerant. And they actually put me up in a, uh, a broom cupboard at the... Um, at the college so that I could see through my uh, my access. At the end of that, I, I, I went to treatment um, on the South Coast. I did really quite well with my education, but it was obvious that if I was going to go to university, that, you know, I'm going to need to get off the methadone, the benzos, and obviously the cocaine and the heroin and the alcohol. Uh, and... At, just as I finished my um, access course, I went to a treatment centre on the south coast uh, in, uh, in in kind of the Bournemouth, Boscombe area. And I, for the first time, was absolutely ready to listen to what the people had to say to me. And I think a certain amount of ego death had occurred, a certain amount of openness and willingness to learn and listen had occurred. And for me, it was it was a kind of perfect storm, actually, for my recovery. And the most crucial thing for me was not only was the deep surrender and an opening up to a spiritual dimension to my life and recovery, but I was taken to certain kinds Sorry, can I just of uh, meetings you a minute? there. Can I just ask you a question? Cause yeah. I'm just personally, like, really interested in uh, how old was you then? Uh, with the recovery, um, yeah, was, when you got that to that point, six, basically six, six and a half years ago. So I'm, I'm, I'll be, I'll be forty four um, in February. So I would have been thirty seven years old, Lester. Well, at that age, I, yeah. I, what, what was sort of interesting to me was again, because in a, in a way, your, I guess the the the, the using route was probably shared by a lot of people, but. What may not have been shared by a lot of people is the fact that you, uh, that you, it seems like you were, you, you did sort of sample many different forms of treatment, uh, went to a lot of the services, to the meetings. So there was a part of you that was kind of seeking that, I guess. Mm. But, but even like that, that where you were working in the services and using with the, so you were gaining quite a lot of knowledge and understanding. So that that part interests me because obviously you're quite an intellectual person and and probably very interested and probably learned quite a lot. And like when you probably said you was a bit of a pain in the ass to the old timers because you probably understood most of what was being said to you to a degree. Um, mm. But all and again, I think this is the thing when when you sort of work in rehab over a lot of years is that and people think oh you know they're just going to go to rehab and then all of a sudden they're going to quit and everybody's going to be happy and when they sort of bomb out and it's like well that's a waste of time waste of money it's like well not really because that's all adding to a mm -hmm. to a pool that at some point is going to be you're going to have enough information enough understanding in yourself to be capable of making that decision because i i really like that bit in the how it works, where it says we're constitutionally incapable. Now, I think most people, I mean, to a degree, you were that, I'd say. But that mm. doesn't mean you're a complete yeah. write-off because you're going through all of that process. Your constitution was developing and growing a capacity. So none of that yeah. was a waste that of time. Is... It was just your journey. That I just wanted to highlight that for people that... It wasn't like you were failing all them times. You were just on your journey to that point. But if it, that all that other stuff didn't happen prior to that, you may never have reached that point. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've often considered that, and I think I think for those people around me who um, <clears throat> who were watching the kind of succession of um, calamity and, and relapse. You know, it was important for them to be able to see it that way as well, I think, that, OK, so it didn't work this time, um, but he must have gained some some self-knowledge uh, mm -hmm. throughout, throughout that process. He, there must have been something taking place. 
uh, I probably couldn't see it, but I think for the people <laughs> around me, you know, they just just in order for them to keep the hope alive, they had to believe that that wasn't a wasted uh, mm. a venture, you know, or endeavor. Um, and I think, you know, this when you get a smart ass like me as well, actually, what what's important, I think, is not just knowledge, but experience. And actually, the some of the subtle stuff that's taking place throughout these different instances of, of kind of relapse and recovery um, are, are vitally important. And, and there's a concept that's kind of well used in research in the clinical world of, of recovery capital. Um, mm. Slightly different, I guess, to the the twelve step conception of um, a really a more spiritual version of um, addiction and recovery. Actually, recovery capital looks at kind of all of the the social sciences, um, you know, psychology, um, economics, sociology. Um, even policy and politics and looks at those spheres uh, spheres I should say and, um, and and looks at what's required in these different areas and the different things that people gather in order to create this bank of recovery so it's a very holistic model for looking at what's going on in someone's life and identifying deficits and assets accordingly across their human experience um and some of that of course is not um is not a kind of gentle strategic process actually some of the stuff that's occurring there is difficult stuff but nonetheless it's very much part of a kind of recovery capital based on experience you know if you're bumping up against different um areas of life and really having to learn about that you'll then adapt and, and learn a way of being in the world that is more balanced, more holistic. Um, and uh, undoubtedly, that, that was what was occurring through, through all that, throughout all of that. You know, mm. I was learning through bitter experience quite often how actually I was going to create a recovery that was going to be fit for purpose for the future and was going to be a benefit to my community and my family, not just getting by not just surviving you know i'm able to look at the process now and say well you had a rough old time of it mate but there's got to be a reason for that there's mm. got to be you know there's this there's, there's, there's learning and experience that took took place there that that meant that i had something to offer in terms of the solution yeah in the end you know yeah cool man yeah so you you've come out. You've gone into this treatment. And you is the and the, the switch yeah. has finally flipped. I think so. Yeah. So I um I mean I don't know to what extent I'm allowed to um, mention different fellowships or or no you it's can say whatever you like, of, mate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> so what there wasn't in Birmingham was um was was cocaine anonymous. That wasn't um, that wasn't a um, really a thing in Birmingham. It was very much um, narcotics anonymous in Birmingham. I think Birmingham has a very solid connections with certain parts of the American experience of NA, and there's always been cross pollination between um, Birmingham and um, America with NA, and we just didn't have a big book uh, CA recovery in in Birmingham at the time. When I was down on the south coast in Boscombe, I always say my spiritual experience happened in two parts, really. I was um, was kind of put into a, a room and, and told to kind of get my bearings in um, in rehab because I, I landed there in, in a dreadful state. You know, my brother and my dad had just kind of dropped me off there, uh, you know, semi-psychotic, uh, already in a state of withdrawal. And I really did truly fall to my knees in an act of radical and real surrender and asked for help and assistance in my life. And that was the first part of my spiritual experience. The second part was the very next day I was taken to a big book study um, in Boscombe. 
um, and I was I was pointed out to parts of the book by very very welcoming and loving old timers with this book essentially about alcoholism that I'd never really wanted to look at because I didn't feel like it captured my experience. It's 1930s antiquated language and you know, mm. talking about the stock market and, and yeah. uh, golf and stuff. I'm American like, what's Christian. What's got to say to me? But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it did that evangelical kind of uh, Protestant Christianity, um, Oxford group vibe to it just uh, didn't gel with me in the past. But that was because I had a head full of ego and, 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 and believing that I knew everything about addiction. But these old timers, they they've highlighted their books and, and their, you know, passages from more about alcoholism and, and there is a solution that just absolutely cornered me and nailed my experience around how I picked up time and time again in a way that was so beautifully simple that I'd never looked at. Mm. I'd always wanted to jump the gun, gun ahead to, you know, how it works or page 60 type gear, mm. you know, why is it that's wrong with my soul, with my uh, experience, without really understanding these fundamentals about my lack of defence against the first one? Now, it seems mad to me today that I'd been around 12-step fellowships for actually about more than a decade before that, in and out, in and out. But no one had actually spent the time taking me truly to step one and using their own experience and the experience of our founding fathers and mothers um, and saying, look, sit down and listen to this. Like what you think you know about your condition, you don't even know the basics. And there was a certain forthrightness to, to the way that that was done um, that just absolutely captivated me. And I really, really welcomed those people into into um, my life and every day that I was uh, at that rehab 28 days fairly classic 28 days all I could afford um, mm. and uh, you know a kind of titration process with with uh, with the drugs but every day all I could wait to do was to get into a meeting with those big book thumpers and and, and learn a bit more about what they had to say and the treatment center was great as well don't get me wrong you know they they there was a lot of stuff there um that was important as well um you know that affirmation actually being kind and uh welcoming to to people in recovery i'd had the, the kind of rehabs that i had been to before i think some of them were followed a more um i don't know kind of 1930s style, uh, break them down, build them back up again kind of method, you know, that it's a kind of antiquated old kind of um, gruelling kind of <laughs> rehab <laughs> procedure. But and, and some of it was brutal, absolutely brutal, uh, run by, you know, kind of, um, oh, God, I don't want to say too much, but just, you know, <laughs> really, really... Uh, uh, it was hardcore, some of them, but this was different, man. They, they, alongside the the good book, big book stuff that I was getting in the meetings, you know, I was taught to to kind of love myself a little bit, you know, mm. to 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 actually not feel like this absolute piece of crap. Um, so it was th these two things came together really in a beautiful concoction of of, of recovery. And while I was there, they also allowed me to do a final assignment rattling my back out i might add you know really in the throes of withdrawal i had to produce one more piece of work that i hadn't managed at the access course and they very kindly allowed me a laptop uh, and some space when other people were doing other activities to finish this assignment which i did in the throes of opiate withdrawal i have no idea to this day how i pulled that off or what the piece of work must have been like but i sent it off to the university of birmingham and I got into um, to the undergraduate political science and social policy course, very prestigious course in a, in a very good university. So it was kind of a remarkable turnaround. But then I arrived at the university, fresh, pretty much fresh out of rehab. I found some big book thumpers in Birmingham um, 
uh, to, to kind of make my tribe. So that was all good. But when I arrived at the university, I was petrified, terrified and um, excited as well. But I didn't want to talk to anyone really about what was going on for me. And I was really quite stubborn um, in not going to seek help from any of the welfare team. You know, I had this idea in my head that I just wanted to be treated like everyone else. It wasn't it wasn't a good mode or model for me but I did well um, and I've really thrived with education and there was something that I really loved about it and, and, and approaching subjects from a really kind of a detailed and analytical way looking at the experiences of other groups in society that I could relate to in terms of addiction I suppose but other movements that have occurred throughout history of people who have been kind of um subjugated by systems or or kind of have have ended up being victims of certain kind of political models or economic models and i could relate a lot of this to my addiction you know i really could mm -hmm. like see how actually the world that we live in uh can can kind of influence um a certain kind of behaviors and even kind of um conditions so yeah, really that's right. I just wanted to throw and... something in because that's important to me as well. Yeah. Just <clears throat> really want to interrupt, but what you're saying there again is just another mm. really interesting thing after sort of 33 years of being around addiction and you go for a period where it's like you feel like you see it everywhere and you think, am I just obsessed by this? But then when you start mm. sort of understanding the power of dependency and for groups mm. to have other groups dependent on them, and and mm. how unhealthy all dependency can be. There's healthy dependencies, but there's very unhealthy dependencies, and and how people can capitalise on that in in our society mm. it is quite disturbing. Mm. It's like I tell people, I say, look, you know, America, they 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 have Independence Day. <laughs> Do you know who that's from? Mm. Us, because I just feel this mm. system that we're in just constantly promotes dependency which promotes anxiety and it doesn't really help people to mm. grow very well i think in america they've gone a little bit too far into the independence and yeah end up with a lot more people on the streets and mental illness and that sort of stuff but uh sorry to interrupt but i think that is really interesting no that I'm, I'm happy for the interruption yeah this, this um i've been um reading uh, recently about this notion of um limbic um capitalism so so this is the concept which um which basically kind of looks at how certain forms of uh economics and marketing have tuned in very much to um addiction just outright mm. addiction how the limbic mm. system reacts to certain um to certain kind of triggers and schemas um and we, we live in an age of limbic capitalism you know certainly when looking at behavioral addictions um you know pornography food gambling and these kind of things there's a kind of unholy alliance between certain elements of psychology and economics that have absolutely tuned in to the way that the human brain acts and they have these kind of, um, they're usually like these, these, these kind of, um, uh, I, I mean, how would you call them? Um, perishable or, or kind of really short, um, short shelf life goods, um, like, you know, digital kind of stuff that's very throwaway or, mm -hmm. Uh, cigarettes are the perfect example. That's the greatest. That's all, that was in of... my mind. I have just done a thing about the uh, vapes and tobacco. Yeah. And when you research the tobacco industry, it's mm. shamelessly disgusting, and 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 the amount of oh yeah, it's probably yeah. one of the best businesses on planet Earth because you gets you addicted to it. Yeah, the nicotine. The tobacco is yeah. just a dispenser yeah. of the nicotine, but now they've switched it to vape. It's yeah. shameless, shocking. It is, it is. Um, and, and, you know, there are very, very kind of embedded um, and, you know, well-funded 
sources uh, of this and, and and you know it's it's quite a frightful picture really for the future because the technology is getting better and better at tuning in to mm. exactly how to how to um create that addictive schema within the individual and, and you know the technology will will just increase and increase mm. to to the level now that um you know the way that digital technology is able to kind of tune into the dopaminergic system and 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 these kind of things you know it's it's it is the the kind of capitalism that we have today you know early capitalism was birmingham's a great uh, story of that you know the, it was the the cabri family the quakers and and, and people like that that had a kind of social responsibility although they were producing very high fat and high sugar goods chocolate which you know work in in in, in an addictive way as well for a lot Works of people for me. that aside you know there, yeah <laughs> <laughs> that aside you know there was some there was it was a different kind of capitalism that that didn't that didn't kind of just utterly uh tune into this um excessive uh, consumption model you know and actually they they promoted abstinence from alcohol and, and you know they had some some fairly benevolent social ideas today there is no morality left in 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 the capitalist market it has been mm -hmm. stripped down to consumption pusher and addict mm -hmm. there, there really isn't many other ways of looking at it and um, recovery is a, a strange kind of example of um, of a, a kind of opposition to that that isn't a isn't a political movement but i you know i have a feeling we'll we'll have a lot to offer the world in terms of how you actually come out of that um but you know what i'm thinking i'm thinking of, Luke, of I'd, I'd really like to do like another podcast uh, in the future with you just to, to learn yeah. more about that because again that's super interesting to uh to me and there's just a ton there mm. because again i think like when we first had our conversation it's i think it's getting an understanding of the human brain like these guys have and i think if you get uh, the mm. knowledge of how your own brain works and and why you're being led into these things and you know it, it, even like trying to talk to somebody yesterday about you know that look when you have childhood issues and you're brought up in a very sort of an alcoholic family it's going to set in motion trains of events that you're going to which i learned that i lived through these events that were not me it was the psychological problems that were installed in me from my childhood and I tell people that I sat in this prison, not I was in there uh, visiting, not um, actually locked up in there. And this psychologist was using me as an example. And they took me through the different stages of my life that from the age of five, if this happens, then by the time you're 11, this happens. By the time you're 16, you're going to be like this. And by the time you're 21, you're going to be a complete basket case. And it was like, oh, my God, it's like a tarot card reading of my life. It was like that it wasn't mm. just random events, it was them behaviours of my parents, that environment that they couldn't help create because they didn't know anything else. It formed certain thoughts and uh, behaviours in my own mind that then I acted on out. And really, free will is one of them things that it's like, we ain't really got any really, but um, very, maybe a very small amount <laughs> But yeah. you can get a little bit more of it if you understand some of these um, processes that you might be stuck in. But that's why I love the 12-step program, because I think that learning to mm. do simple infantry and breaking down what I'm mm. doing and what my responses are, I've just never found anything more simple. But you do have to practice it, and that's a lot of people I don't think realise the power of self-observation and doing good infantry but learning how to make the corrective measure, which is going to give you a different life experience. So so I'd really love uh, some time to go deeper into that. But mm. I guess that brings you up to say so you're in university now and um, yeah, realising that there could be something more 
there to help people like yourself do you know? yeah was was part of was part of that feeling you had do you think would have been a bit of um you just didn't really want people to know who you were or where you were coming from so i guess you're around a lot of people that aren't like that did you feel different in that sense or like you had to hide yeah. it a bit yeah, I, 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 that's how I felt. Um, I don't know whether or not that that was true. You know, um, I, I was on a, a um, you know, a social science course, which was political science. And, you know, a lot of the young people on that course, you know, would absolutely thrive on being inclusive and uh, and hearing about people's life experience. But I don't know exactly what it was. Um, that made me feel so vulnerable and exposed about talking about addiction. Because if pushed, I can remember speaking to one welfare tutor where I had, you know, a lot of kind of, by now I've got two children as well. I'm also working um, to pay my, my way through really um, with very kind of complex needs, autistic children. So, you know, there was a lot, a lot going on and there was a lot of stress and and um it, mental health uh, stuff going on as well so I, I went to speak to a welfare tutor and at a push I, I would mention that you know i've had a past history of, of of depression and anxiety there's something about saying that i was a that i am a recovering drug addict that i just just couldn't get out of my mouth really because I thought that I had self stigma. I had, yeah. I had a real a real sense of self stigma, um, and the image that I had in my mind of someone like that, I suppose, in light of this environment, this academic environment, was this um, kind of hopeless, desperate, unworthy. Um, you know, uh, untrustworthy, slightly unhinged, uh, dangerous character, um, which was so juxtaposed to, to all of the spiritual experience that I was having in the 12 steps and working with others as well, you know, which was, which was a crucial part of our, our 12 suggestion. Uh, but still within me lived this self stigma in light of, the big bad world, I suppose, you know, the system, uh, academia, government, these kind of things, you know, there was something about me that didn't really want to talk to these people about that stuff. Um, even though what I was hearing for the most part from my tutors and from lecturers were that they were actually taking apart and analysing these systems of power and knowledge that, that kept people vulnerable and subjugated. So really they were telling me, they were giving me space to be able to talk about that stuff, but the mm. self stigma was, was strong in mm. me. Um, and also there was a kind of pride, I guess, which was like, I want to do this without um, being kind of coddled in any way along the way. I want to be able to say that I've got this <clears throat> degree without any help. No, I, I, I don't. I don't suggest that for other people, by the way. It, it, you know, it's it's a kind of false pride that I was suffering from at the time. But but what happened was, um, I think it was right at the end of my second year undergrad, I had a chance encounter on campus with Dr. Ed Day, who is the he's a very well loved and well known uh, addictions consultant psychiatrist who's been honestly working on the front line of addiction services in Birmingham for as far back as I can remember. And I rocked up to my first addiction service when I was 14 years old. Mm. Um, so Ed has always been there and he has never been one of these people in an ivory tower. He, he worked, trust me, on the front line in some areas of Birmingham that, you know, people would say were no go zones. Like Ed, Ed was a, was a, you know, a uh, trudger man he, he he turned up for addiction and and 
I bumped into Ed on campus and I knew Ed well and we'd worked together before on kind of harm reduction stuff and uh, and different bits of research before. And he couldn't quite believe uh, what, you know, he was seeing he, me on the campus. And he was like, what, what are you doing here, Luke? I, I, honestly, I... I <laughs> I was worried to, I wasn't even sure you were alive or, or if you were locked up or what. And then I said, well, I'm a second year undergrad yet. I've, I've been studying here for two years. And it, and it really just, um, you know, I think he, he he previously thought, you know, was I coming to burgle the place or rob an <laughs> IT lab or something? But when he heard that, he was amazed, really, uh, because the last he'd heard from me, I was, you know, really, really in trouble. And then thus began a, a series of conversations about um, my experience and what could be learned about people in terms of education and recovery. And actually in America, since the very early 1980s, they've had collegiate recovery programs, recovery programs in <laughs> higher education institutions. Now, the oldest ones, uh, I think it's Brown University, um, New Jersey. And then there are a lot of different iterations and versions of these collegiate recovery programs all over America, all very diverse. Some of them, you know, within the Bible Belt, you know, might be very kind of evangelical Christian leanings. Um, you know, on the East Coast, there'll be very kind of... Um, liberal and activist based movements you know each one very very different but with this um guiding principle of offering recovery and education side by side two really congruent concepts recovery and education share an awful lot of common ground you know this this idea that open-mindedness and learning are, are a solution in our lives to some of the difficulties we're having you know this idea of um, exploration and stepping out into the world coming coming out of the shadows and into the light you know actually turning up and and kind of putting your hands out and saying right what's this what's this world got to offer what a fantastic, amazing thing, you know, if I didn't have that in my recovery, I'm not sure how well I'd be doing, man, because the excitement and the absolute raw possibility of what there is out there to discover, it, it, you know, it's the bright spot of my life alongside um, carrying this, the, the message of recovery. Um, mm. So those conversations became uh, the kind of early stages of developing really the first integrated European collegiate recovery program in the UK with all the cultural dimensions and social dimensions that would make it work in England as, as opposed to America, because America has a very embedded culture of recovery, the yeah. birthplace of the 12 steps. You know, it, it's a culture that is very comfortable with recovery. In fact, if you, if you open up a box set on Netflix, the likelihood is you're going to see at least one character who's in 12 step recovery within that box set throughout the duration of the uh, series. So utterly embedded in the culture, certainly not in the UK. Uh, the case that that is um, that the recovery is a very comfortable notion. Yeah, sorry, for, and, for and, and, and recovery is, I think, I think most people, obviously, the general public, if you spoke to them, recovery is a good thing. But actually, when you actually talk about recovery in professional circles, it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> mm. But but in America, well, it yes. is considered a it is considered a really good thing on in, even in corporate levels. It's something that if you sort of got a five years in recovery, that would be a real plus. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a very different attitude. I mean, I always feel like being a professional twelve step at that. Oh. Again, it could be just me, but I don't think so. But I often feel that in professional circles, I'm like the last person anyone wants to listen to in the room. There's all these other uh, agendas that uh, seem to take precedent. Yes. Well, um, my God, you know, you could have a series of podcasts <laughs> on, that, on that subject alone. 
Well, um, cause, sorry, mate. Really just want to interfere. Yeah. Just want to yeah. just want to butt in one more time, and then I'll let you. Yeah. It's because even that. It's because because it, it, on on uh, this Thursday, I'm talking to this lady Anne Marie from from Glasgow, who's uh, put a. I don't know if you know her, but she's put a right to recover. Uh, yeah. Bill, yeah. Billing to the government. But so we've just sort of been having some conversations of her and the difference between Scotland and like you say, even in Scotland, it seems up the north end has just sold out on harm minimalisation and and um, not too much. I mean, there is recovery, but they sort of didn't have rehabs sort of pumping out people into the, the community, which kind of start populating the services. And in England, I think we sort of got harm minimalisation is the order of the day, but like 50% of the people that work in them are, have sort of come through recovery. But when you talk to them, they're not really allowed to express too much of that. And I always find that it just seems strange that you've got these fantastic examples of where you can get to uh, in recovery, um, but they're not really allowed to, to say too much of that. And again, I'm not against harm minimalization i think they're two very sort of different parts of the same thing but one really doesn't get much um promotion yeah i mean i, I you know i i i share your um your concern and and your analysis there and i guess it, it, for me it's like so so what what can be done uh, about this and I think another element to what is going on at the University of Birmingham is to create a very robust and you know absolutely dot the I's and cross the T's in terms of making gold standard research um, that gives recovery perhaps what it's lacking in those clinical settings that you're talking about which is really solid research because no. that is that's the stick that's the stick that they wield oh, is that yeah, you know oh, we've got these 100%. quantitative data yeah. yeah but we can do that we can no, do yeah. that Lester and and, and yeah. that that, that we is, should we should that, that, is, is, something what's, that... that is what's missing it's yeah. like there's such a lot yeah. of fantastic stories like your own and it would be just nice mm. if they you know just got heard and that people could see that mm. that recovery is possible might not be for everybody but a lot of people are doing fantastic i think we we're just talking with uh with matt before saying you know we're going to do another little podcast but uh, living the dream but because some of the fantastic stories like your own of people that have actually sort of not just got clean and you know living some um difficult life but they've actually started to live in their dream and, 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 and their life's been restored and become contributors to the community. And I've just, it's just nice to people to know that is available if you should want to do the work it takes to get there. And I, I never considered what you said there before, but again, it was just fantastic because again, that was the way it was for me. When I come into that 12 step program, I felt so inspired by it. And there was, cause I couldn't even read or write at 25 but I was badly educated, but I feel like I'm quite an intelligent person and that's almost like some sort of disability. And so getting education over my life is, you know, if, if somebody said to me, what is the worst abuse you endured as a child? He'd be saying, I'd say, not getting educated. It, it caused me so many problems. So listening to you saying that, I never quite got that concept until you said that you know, addiction, uh, recovery and education have got so much in common. I'm like, yeah, I get that because I believe addiction is a closed mind and recovery is an open mind. That's why I like the God thing because you can't ask a person to open their mind more than believing in some existence of some creator. It's like, it blows my mind, but it's uh, it's just fantastic hearing you say that. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the congruence between recovery and education is, as you know, if you could summarize my story into what makes my recovery journey unique, I think it's that the combination of those two things, just the alchemy of that created, uh, you know, truly uh, fourth dimensional levels of, uh, mm. of, of experience in me. And, and 
why wouldn't I make my life about that and spreading that and learning as much as I can about that and uh, making that available to others? And honestly, you know, I think your your own experience there, Lester, uh, that that you know, poor education based on so social circumstances and psychological issues along the way, you know, should not uh, discount you from having a full experience of education. Um, and, you know, I'm all about being able to try and promote that and create that. But again, just like self stigma and public stigma. Um, so self stigma is the is the internal voice stuff the the, the things that we're telling ourselves uh, you know, in that bondage of self kind of way. And then the public stigma actually reinforces that all the time. Uh, mm. So it actually tells us time and time again, yeah, actually, you are an imposter. Yeah, you know, the, 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 there, are, there are subtle um, forms of language and this kind of thing that actually um, kind of unconsciously are being fed to us all the time about how actually this isn't you know the right place for us or we are kind of um out of our depth but you know in terms of um how you how you open up recovery to people as well you know i think it is it is a balance between that self stuff and public stuff as well and these these are the kind of fronts that you need to approach it by so how do we allow uh, more and more people to believe that um, that their education is the right thing for them. Well, there mm. needs to be a public effort towards that. But also there is the, the, the more spiritual, psychological uh, elements of how we kind of open our own minds and, and start to believe that, that that's a possibility. So, um, so yeah, I think you know there's there's development needed in both areas. There, the public need to be able to be more comfortable with the fact that not everyone just you know has this linear uh, cookie cutter life of kind of eighteen, leave college, meet a girl, go to university, learn what you want to learn, and mm. you know, there's a whole heap of experience in terms of people's lives and what they have to offer. You know, I would argue that someone like yourself um, on a pretty much any undergraduate level course across all of the academy, science and social science, would have so much to offer uh, any classroom, not just the individual, you know, and that was my experience as well. I may not have let on in the earlier days uh, that addiction was my problem, but I had an awful lot of experience of what it meant to fall through the cracks of society. I had practical mm. knowledge of that in a way that the lecturers didn't even have. They used to speak yeah. about social uh, security and things like that. And I, not too arrogantly, I would put my hand up and say, well, let me give you a bit of experience of that. You know, this is how it actually goes down. Um, trying not to be too arrogant, and, and I had to tune yeah, that facts and time. figures, facts and figures, <laughs> which a lot of people don't always get that haven't had the experience. Doesn't doesn't, in my yeah. experience, often match up with the reality. Yeah, and so yeah. I find that a lot of them guys, it's like they're making really good decisions on the data, which you said we need to produce mm. some data of our own for our yeah. experience. Yeah. Because then they would make better decisions based on the reality mm. that I think that they seem to mm. miss quite a lot. And that, uh, what I've noticed about myself is I love mm. the education, I do love the data, I love the analysing, but I'm more mm. into the experience. But we seem to be in a society that policy and procedure is more important mm. <clears throat> than outcome. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, there's the quantitative level of counting and uh, statistics, and then there's the qualitative level of qualia experience. What are these people actually experiencing? What is going on? What themes can we draw out of people's life? Let's take that seriously. Uh, mm -hmm. And let's actually make some policy based on that stuff, on, on qualia, on, on qualitative measures. All too often it's based on well, you know, 
uh, <laughs> a certain kind of treatment outcomes that are that are just economically driven and utterly naive you know yeah and obviously yeah. not working Again, that great that's another no, story it, you know take a look around <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's another yeah. podcast. <laughs> so, yeah. so the uh, they're, they're, they're... so t- tell us about the recovery program and what it kind of looks like. Mm. Uh, did did uh, yeah. uh, how did you get it? How did you get it actually into the to the university? How did they receive it? Yeah. So so um, it was. From the very start, it was co-designed and co-produced. So, so that's a really important um, notion that I think is worth mentioning. So it wasn't just uh, the university or even Ed uh, deciding what he thought was best and what was needed for students in recovery. It started with Ed and I, and I was still a student at that time. Um, and then as we started to kind of put out a call for action for other students in recovery, and I think that is always the first step in a collegiate recovery program. Sounds like something that, that surely should be fairly easy. Let's find out how many people actually identify as being in recovery from addiction in this university campus. Turns out that's a really difficult thing to do. And it <laughs> continues to be the most difficult thing to do uh, because yes this is where you start to bump up against perhaps some of the uh the institutional uh concepts and and, and standards within within uh, an academic institution that actually probably doesn't really want to highlight um very much about addiction um or mental health to be honest with you because yeah. that is not uh the story that goes in the brochure um for prospective students and research grants and this kind of thing all that being said i I would like to you know give absolute credit to the university of birmingham because it turns out that for me it was the most unlikely institution to be able to get on board with this because it's part of what's called the russell group which includes the red brick universities and oxford and cambridge and these kind of universities So for me, it would have made more sense to go to the city university, more vocational university here in Birmingham, where I knew there was quite a lot of uh, uh, people in recovery because, I, you know, they're part of my home group and fellowship. But it turns out that that with with kind of the co-design and co-production, so we found people in recovery, we asked them what they wanted and what they needed. We started little small groups up and just got it going and then ed really was was um was the secret to kind of breaking through the the more top brass levels of the uh university because he understood the language of academia and of research and of the benefit to the institution and he really just diligently knocked on every bloody door every head of department vice chancellor chancellor you know he 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 really just he's a trudger like i said before (laughs) um and um and then what he would do is and this turns out to be a classic combination is he'd kind of hustle his way into certain meetings you know with top brass type individuals he would absolutely nail the brain science he's a neuroscientist amongst other things so you know people He's very believable when it comes to the science. And then he'd do that for roughly 15 minutes. And then he'd bring me in for the final 15 minutes of qualitative, raw, experience, strength and hope material. A combination of these two things, it turns out, in any boardroom in the land, I would say, will have real effect on on the people in the room. And we just did that a lot, Lester. We went to different departments, welfare, you know, different schools of education within the university and, and took that roadshow out there, really, and kind of changed the hearts and minds of the people there and truly started to embed the programme into the university structure. I think that's the difficult part. And without Ed's assistance, I don't know that I would have approached it in that way. It would have been more of a kind of activist way if it was just left to me. I'd kind of be a bit more of a rabble rouser, I think. 
Uh, And I've I've used some of that harm reduction style activism that I learned, you know, while I was still using to kind of, uh, you know, really say we're here and and we need representation. But Ed was careful with that stuff. It's like those kind of movements quite often die out and they fizzle and burn quite quickly. But you need to embed into the structure of these things. Be there for the long haul and uh, and really develop things like research basis you know let's do this properly um and, and that's what we've we've done i On guess the, brand, the spirit of ai looked... and the 12 step fellowship is always yeah. that attraction over promotion i guess does that fit into what you're sort of saying yeah. there yeah 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 i mean you know there's there's some need for a certain level of um of promotion just to raise awareness and to mm-hmm. say that um, you know, addiction is a thing for young people. Um, yeah. because I think that's another point I'd like to make Lester is that not only was there prejudice perhaps from elements of, uh, the system or, or the university really around this idea of opening up the subject of, uh, addiction and recovery with young people, I felt that prejudice from the world of 12-step recovery as well uh, and it's mm. that classic kind of thing uh you know i've spilt more beer than you've sucked lad kind of thing uh how could you possibly how could you yeah, possibly i was, know I was only 25 when i was only 25 <laughs> when i come in aa in the 90s so yeah, it's yeah. like i've got yeah, plenty of that plenty of that yeah. even in my own head yeah i was thinking i could probably get another yeah. 10 years out of this yeah <laughs> yeah so I was up against all of that as well and, and try, you know, because of course I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of sell this idea to the recovery community as well, because you, you can't have any recovery program without the larger ecosystem, the ecology of uh, recovery in the city or town yeah. or, or area. And I just, I just want to share this story with you, because again, it's like, I don't often get to yeah. talk to somebody like yourself, but... Over the years, I've yeah. done quite a lot of talks to professionals. I've been to a lot of them rollouts of the uh, of the local services, and again, they just always like they're always like I couldn't see recovery in what they were saying, and and you try and tell them, but they're like, oh, you're being negative, you're being negative. It's like well, not really. I heard this eight years ago. You're going to do it again. I call it the next social experiment, and uh, so I sort of when I got talks, I start. I thought I'd. So I come up with this story. I said, look, I said, look, imagine it like this. Imagine you've got a fruit and veg shop and you've got all the healthy fruit and veg. And, and when I come to these rollouts, it's like I come in and you go, oh, look at all the uniforms. I'm like, they're lovely uniforms. Oh, look at all the potatoes. I said, they're the most beautiful potatoes I've seen. The staff are well trained. It's fantastic. You've got great cabbages, great apples, great oranges. But I can't see it completely working because you've got no bananas. And these people have got a potassium deficiency being recovery for me. So if you give them bananas, all that other fruit will work good because it doesn't matter what healthy fruit you give people. But if you don't give them the bananas, then they ain't going to get well. And because, again, I kind of looked at it like, look, recovery is like 2%. The rest of your life's like 98%, but most people are spending 98% of the time on the 2%, and 2% of the time on the 98%. But then I go back to the people in recovery, tell them the same story and go, look, you lot can't live on bananas. <laughs> you need some of that other fruit <laughs> to get a healthy yeah. diet, but you do need the both of yeah. them. Now, there is more of that other stuff than recovery, but the 2% is the foundation. Without that recovery... You're just yeah. not going to get to the 98%. So keep giving people the 98% mm-hmm. without the 2%. It's not going to go very well for them in the long run. That's all I'm saying. That's a, you know, a really good analogy, man. You know, um, I, I like that. It, it, it works. It absolutely works. And I guess, you know, the job of, of trying to convince um, commissioners, politicians, university vice chancellors of what is going on in that two percent 
let alone trying to get the people within that 2% to agree upon what, <laughs> yeah. what's going on. Because they're all bananas. Um, because that's a hell of a job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, that. But we've come up against these things before, and you're quite right, Lester. You know, I've been actually working in addiction services on and off since about 2007 in many different versions of that when they kind of roll out the new agenda or whatever i try and adapt to what that is all the while still using most of the time and then uh, i you know i help them get their show on the road um and and it's um there's always as far as i can see been something fundamentally lacking in the understanding of what recovery is and does and i think the university actually it turns out is a really interesting space it's almost a microcosm of a society so it acts like a kind of mini society that has its own economics its own political system to a certain extent mm. so if you can learn how to embed a really really good and fit for purpose recovery uh, service that's co-produced and co-designed by people in recovery that really yeah. uh, gives people in recovery a voice um, doesn't shut them down in terms of their different ways of looking and conceiving of recovery uh, has a real learning element to it as well i think if you can if you can learn to pull it off somewhere like that then it it, it could work out i'm not saying it will we don't know but it could work out to be a good model or what maybe has been missing a little bit in these different iterations of recovery agendas and stuff. We mm. need to, we need that research base and we need, we need, uh, so we, we need kind of new, new kind of voices in recovery a lot of the time as well. And the young voice is a really interesting, it's a really interesting one, man. I mean, like behavioral addictions are the ones on the rise. Unsurprisingly, right. we're talking about a generation of people who have never lived without one of these in their pocket, um, or at least in their parents' hands. And, you know, I'm learning every day about what that means. And, and you know, when I first kind of started out in, in this collegiate recovery, I was probably of the more of the old school mind of like, what, they're addicted to smartphones. Wait till he's got a needle hanging out his arms and then he, and then he can come and talk to me, you know? I, I wasn't all the way like that, but it was a bit like, you know, the real alcoholic who speaks so, about. So you understand books, you know. them old alkies now, don't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the real deal, you know, yeah. All of that stuff. But I tell you what, being open minded and, and uh, willing throughout the process of listening to what these young people were telling me about um, their experiences of, of powerlessness around different technologies, behaviors, and new substances. I, I'm enlightened by it. And, and crucially, you know, recovery models work for these individuals, as long as you take them seriously. Mm. And, um, and you kind of you offer all that good stuff that we know works, Lester. And yeah, I've, I've changed 180 on that, just a full turn from from the old, uh, more about alcoholism, um, big book thumper. You know, I still love that stuff, but I'm very open-minded about experiences that people are having of addiction that don't necessarily match my own or the accepted wisdom because I yeah. see it day in, day out. And I, yeah. I know just how, 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 um, how brought to their knees these kids well, are you being even get that things, man. So you even get that with like the spiritual malady I've come to believe is that f separation. Um, mm. and so even all the different addictions, like, you know, heroin, alcohol, marijuana, sex, you know, all the addiction can actually carry on making us feel different and separate and not being able to identify with each other. But I also notice that even in 12 step, the recovery program is pretty much the same. The method is the same, which brings us back mm. together again. And and so mm. I understand the importance of, in early doors for people to identify with, you know, it's very hard for a heroin addict 
to identify with a marijuana addict and vice versa. But as you get past that bit, the recovery is the same for everybody. I like the fact yeah. that brings us all back together again, that we're all in this uh, together and the community is important for all of us and, and for all of us to be successful is what's going to make the world a better place, not just some of us on every level. Yeah. And, and offering Absolutely. people that opportunity you know. is important. Yeah. It, yeah. It, so if somebody was to come, so I guess how long is that? How long has your um, program actually been in the college? So I guess it's evolving, is it? Uh, even yeah. the fact you're saying the people coming in it can evolve it and develop it and mm -hmm. so what what's yeah. actually would um how, how far has it got what does it look like actually if somebody sort of comes to mm. university with an addiction problem and they, they want to be a part of that what what would be available to them in terms mm. of support and development and mm. Mm. yeah so so um the the way it looks uh, as as a program is is basically a kind of menu of options that works as a timetable across uh, the campus. So in the same way that students have um, you know a history seminar over here, perhaps a politics uh, lecture over there. Parallel to that, we we run a, a menu of options. Um, for people in order to explore and maintain and sustain their recovery life on, on campus. So on Mondays, we have uh, Vipassana Mindfulness of Breathing practice. Oh, I've done I, a 10-day uh, course, isn't it? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably, you know, the most imp one of the most important elements of my own personal recovery is, is very Vipassana good. meditation. Yeah, mm. it's, it's it's changed my life completely. Yeah. Uh, some of the students like that, and and it's a practice that they get a good deal from. Uh, for others, definitely not their thing. They, you know, they mm. didn't they didn't kind of identify this as any part of their problem or solution, so they don't attend that group. Um, and then on uh, Thursdays we have a twelve step recovery group where people uh, from the Birmingham recovery community come to share their experience, strength and hope with the, the students, some of them having had some experience of education, others not at all. Um, that's a very well attended group. Um, it's, it's the longest running group that we have. We kind of started with a 12 step group uh, and just kind of colonize that space um, mm. on campus and in the timetable just to keep that running, you know. We have the Friday Recovery Celebration Group, which is the best attended group. That will have anything from usually about 15 to 30 students in it, all wow. in recovery, all identifying as being in recovery, all in different types of recovery. And we have a topic-based conversation around recovery. It's a brilliant group. It's not got a 12-step focus. It doesn't have any particular focus. It's a genuinely heartwarming, celebratory and fascinating group. And every Friday we've been doing that for, for more than two years now. Really a wonderful group um, that has just evolved according to the people inside the group. And it almost has a kind of unbroken chain of kind of topics that have just been evolving over time that are just utterly fascinating and, and, and really a wonderful group. We have sober social activities, so once a month um, we're lucky enough to have a small budget to go out into Birmingham City Centre quite often or into the surrounding area, the more natural kind of countryside bits. And we go out together and we either go for some food or we go for a walk or we go to see some theatre or we go to some sports uh, events. And we all do that together with a recovery kind of uh, head on um, and, and to be honest with you, a lot of the uh, social activities that have occurred as part of the programme have been completely outside of the programme's control and my control mm. through the thriving kind of WhatsApp community. If a student really likes house music and it, and, and it wants to go out into <clears throat> Birmingham City Centre, doesn't want to actually leave alone his music life or her music life, then he'll say, I'm going out to this. Would some other students come with me so I feel safe if they're interested in this kind of music 
and they'll go out together, Leicester, and they'll go into Digworth yeah. or, or some of the more underground bits of Birmingham, and they'll be absolutely fine if they go as a little crew. That's yeah, been our experience. I found, so I found that social, all... sorry, found that social life can be very yeah. problematic for a lot of people coming into recovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, very much so. I mean, and, and, and as a student, you know, the the idea of the kind of the the, the social death of recovery is a very real thing. You know, they really mm. do talk about that a lot. That well, that just means my life's over. I'll never be able to do this. I won't be able to. Uh, I'll lose this music. I'll lose this edge. Girls won't like me, or boys won't like me. Um, there's a lot on. You know, I mean, some of it you have to take with a pinch of salt. <laughs> as as a man in your forties, you've got to be like, oh right, you know, your life's going to end, <laughs> is it? You know, but what what they're saying is 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 true to them. You know, so the idea that we can keep a social element to it is incredibly important. And again, because it's co-designed and co-produced, we take seriously what, what they tell us, you know, that, that mm. well, actually the social element of recovery is probably the most important for me. I need to be able yeah. to go out and do stuff socially. Otherwise yeah. I'm not on board with this. It um, even program. says in the AA, in the AA so, literature, because people often say, you know, Oh, you can't go here, you can't go there. But it's not what it says in the AA book. It says you could be able to go anywhere, nah. even whoopee parties, whatever that was. But <laughs> but but it says if you can't go and yeah. have a normal social life, then there's something wrong with your spiritual and I like that mental condition. So, you know, once you yeah. get that nailed down, there should you should be able to go if everyone's going out drinking, there's no reason you can't go along and have a good time I think you might realise yourself yeah. once it gets to about 10 o'clock you don't want to be around them all anyway but <laughs> yeah. or you become the designated driver all the time <laughs> yeah yeah it don't stop you having yeah. fun anyway but it's nice to have recovery buddies no. and do different no. things because it brings a different element to your life as well that you that you might want to enjoy yeah do they do yeah. like mentorship yeah. or do people tend to just sort of buddy up or yeah so um the, the, i guess the the main kind of um mentorship really would be um yes definitely the, there's a kind of organic process of those students that have been around um a while longer kind of mentoring the uh, the newcomers to the program through the process. In terms of actual designated time, I'm <clears throat> on Mondays and Fridays, I'm in a lovely space called The Lodge, which is a kind of therapeutic space on campus. And um, I'm available for one-to-one -one time with students to drop in or book a bit of time with me. You know, that's not a counseling or ther psychotherapeutic uh, service although some of those skills come into it as you'll know yourself from from mm. from just kind of recovery life but um it's a, it's just a place for them to really come and share where they're at with their education their recovery their home life their social life um and it's not always just one-to-one -one with me there might be some other students around that are just you know, we've got coffee facilities and we've got, it's a comfortable, warm place. So it's a bit of a hub of activity uh, where the students can really kind of get out of the really frenetic environment of the campus and just chill in, in the lodge and talk about their recovery and, yeah. uh, and, and things like that. There's a lot of areas of development that, uh, that are taking place. Um, so the, 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 um, the program continues to grow. We now have recovery accommodation um on on the the campus and that is is we, we didn't think we'd, we'd get there for at least another two three years but the accommodations team were people who understood the impact of addiction in their uh, accommodation you know actually it turns out they were the people that understood addiction recovery better than anyone on the whole campus because they saw the kids hauled up in their room hoovering up cat or or kind of at the bottom of a bottle for for days on end so um they they got what we were doing and, and the idea of a recovery focus not just a sober house uh within the accommodations was 
um, was something they really kind of understood and, 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 and wanted us to help facilitate. So that's currently um, a house of, of, of four people in, in really good uh, recovery. And it's a very re recovery focused environment where they have their own house groups. They go out and do activities together. They eat together. They cook together. Um, and you've got different types of recovery and, and, and experiences really kind of supporting one another within that household. So all the time, this is evolving and growing. Mm. Luke, the question in my head, <clears throat> being from sort of spending most of my career running a rehab, is mm. uh, how would somebody... If, if somebody's listening to this and they've got a drug and alcohol problem, it's not somewhere they can sort of necessarily come to kick their habit, but I guess it, that, that's yeah. not available yet. It'd be nice in the future, I guess, for that to be an option for people, yeah. but it would be somebody like yourself that's kind of in early recovery. They think they want to get their life restarted again. They feel that education, as so mm. many do, and, and rightly so, would be the solution mm. to them. Um they did find that there's a course they would like in uh, Birmingham University, and would they would that mm. would that be something they would then get into the university and contact you guys, or is it something they could do hand in hand with that to see if there's a place for them and the support that they feel that they need for their recovery through that process? I I think probably the the gold standard or the most ideal way I could see it working would be well there's different there's different types of students and, and what we've identified very clearly really is an almost 50 50 split more like 60 40 but very close to 50 50 of people like myself mature students who actually have you know been out there causing havoc in their own lives and the lives of others for, an, for a long time and actually want education and recovery to be very linked as part of their kind of recovery experience. And quite often those people um, haven't had much education, actually. Um, but I, I think for those, for those kinds of people, it's um, the, the gold standard way I could see it working is that at rehabs or treatment type options, the conversation about something like collegiate recovery could be started at that kind of level. And then within our connections as this big thing called recovery um, and, and, and treatment, you know, through, through connections and processes, that the idea that actually the rest of their life could encompass some education is um is really kind of threaded in uh you know during during the time at rehab rehab or in treatment mm. and then myself i and, and and ed and and the rest of the students you know we help facilitate that that move into into higher education and we're already doing that and, and in some cases that means that i have contact with people doing access courses for you uh, for university in one case two years before they ever came to the university but i'm checking in with them um in terms of their recovery and education while they're going through uh the access course so it's about kind of smoothing the transitions and, and opening up these opportunities for people to have uh, recovery and education together. And that's classically the kind of group like myself, mature students. So for the younger students, um, it's, it's, it's more difficult because, you know, the, these are, are quite often young people who really don't know a thing about recovery. Actually, sometimes they've never really considered that they've got an addiction. Mm. And the kind of um, settings that they're coming from means that it's not about kind of coaching them into the idea of their recovery and their education being together. It's about talking to them actually about the ways that they've been using and kind mm. of starting those conversations about, well, have you considered that this could be looked at as an addiction uh, and 
there's you know these models of <clears throat> recovery from that. Uh, so they're two two very different I mean, that, uh, that's groups. Very but essentially, sorry, that's that's, yeah. that's another uh, that's another angle there yeah. that uh, has been very important to me to to realise that again we're so far behind as a society uh, in understanding. So having that ev evidence based model and being able to show people that these are the symptoms and behaviours of somebody developing addiction, that, mm. that I believe that once society does get their head around that, that they can identify them signs very early on in people, younger people, and start doing yeah. very good interventions and save the 10, 20 years of beating yourself, smashing yourself up to come to that conclusion. Because, uh, and so I think interventions are ultimately going to be the solution to the problem but early on in people just to show them like like, like this is what's going on for you and you, you can deal with it now before it gets very difficult to deal with so again what you're saying there that, that's you know, quite fascinating as well yeah and you know that is I'm an absolute believer in just that, Lester, that, that um, there is a way of interve intervening, early intervention models for addiction, which, which is um, hugely controversial, not at all researched, really. Uh, and most kind of people are not really on board with that in the world of research and in the world of recovery, to be honest with you. Again, back yeah, to those kind of, uh, old timer conceptions of like, well, how could they possibly know? They're not the real deal yet. They haven't crossed the invisible light, all of that kind of gear. But I have seen it happen. I, 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 I have seen that with mm. the intervention of collegiate recovery, with the opening up of um, the world of recovery, including community connection, these different models of psychological and even spiritual well-being introduced to these young people, not being patronising to them, but actually saying, no. you know what, I, I think I think the full force of what recovery has to offer, these kids can take it on board. They'll be all right. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it work. It, you know, I, I'm very blessed to see the actual, um, I, I, I can see these changes occur in people. Of course, I don't know what the rest of their life entails, but that they are very well embedded with, with their own recovery uh, lives. Mm -hmm. at sometimes, you know, starting at the age of, of uh, 17, 18, 19, it's a well, reality. Again, in America, I, I see it. it in America, yeah. that would be more common because that's become embedded in their society a lot more. That they have their icky par and yeah. things like that, where they do have very young yeah. people that yeah. identifying themselves very quickly. In because again, being in a mass experience for over three decades, my research model, which holds no water anywhere except in my own head, that I honestly believe that once society understands the mental processes of addiction and starts doing effective interventions, I think you can get rid of 80% of the addiction problems on planet Earth in three generations. Just saying. That's... <laughs> because... Yeah. Because well, it can be... Yeah. Because, again, like, like yourself, once you actually get that moment of realisation, which does take a bit of time because you kind of have to figure... Even though there's a lot of people... Um, it's kind of like a through naturally, it's like a sloppy intervention. You're picking up a little bit here, another little bit five years later, ten years later. Mm. It, I think if that can be bought a lot sooner, that where you mm. realise yourself, you've got all the data that you need to make a better decision and then want it. Mm. But it doesn't take long after that period to then start improving your life but i think the older you get the more damage that you do the more difficult the less you actually have the ability to hear through lots of reasons because again you know whatever the problem that starts people's addiction then addiction itself causes so many other issues and makes it harder and harder for people to hear 
and to read the feedback of their life. Mm. And, and, and yeah. if you don't develop the, the clarity of mind at some point, and again, this is why I struggle with the harm minimalization. My biggest problem with it is some of them chemicals you're giving people are making it impossible for them to recover because it's dumbing their brain down too much. And that's a bit of a mm. bit of an issue. And I think in the future, maybe the better medications <clears throat> will all be a part of people's journey. But I don't think we're we're quite there yet. But but I do believe that knowing that this is a treatable problem, but it needs to be understood. And and again, it's is going to be founded on guys like yourself getting that research getting that research mm. to the people that can understand it and then start making better decisions for us. Yeah. I, you know, it's, uh, let, let's hope that, um, that kind of through, through better than well, through the collegiate recovery program at the university of Birmingham as a kind of model going forward for other universities to take on board and and you know we're already offering that as a kind of freeware you know uh, it, it's it we're not we're not trying to create a private um market or model here we're we're this is open source material if you're interested mm -hmm. in starting something like this at an educational institution we are developing the research here you are have it you know crack on let's 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 start let's get this movement happening and then over time yeah i think you know some of the credibility that um addictions and recovery research has gained in america is because they've had collegiate recovery programs there since the 1980s they've had academics openly in recovery at the front of lecture halls for a generation now uh, you know, we're far behind in that sense in, in, in the UK. And, and, you know, there is a deep suspicion amongst the treatment system um, of recovery um, that I know it's quite a lot. And, and we don't want to be too, too cynical about that, but I think sometimes they're very threatened about what we can offer. Um, and, and actually, there is there is a notion that that that, that, there, that there really is a solution in what we have to offer which would render some of their treatment options um unneeded <laughs> quite often mm. so yeah, yeah. i you, you know there's there's a lot there's a lot to there's a lot to the subject but um collegiate recovery which hasn't really happened in in uh, europe before I think it's going to be a really crucial part of the evolution of of uh, of, of recovery in uh, in this country. Um, you know, yeah. Is there any other colleges or universities? Students. Sorry, yeah. the yeah, there is. is, there, there, is, there, is there... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's 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 um, at Teesside University uh, there is um, recovery connections, so it's slightly different model from ours. Um, Dot Smith's organisation, Recovery Connections, um, actually kind of administers and delivers recovery uh, at Teesside University. Not employed by, so it's kind of a third sector organisation, Recovery uh, Lived Experience organisation, Alero, delivering um, recovery or administrative administering uh, recovery at the university slightly different from our model where i'm employed by the university of birmingham so is ed we're kind of embedded within the system there both of those different models have their have their uh, benefits and uh, costs um but you know that's the whole point really is that it's going to be different in every different part of the uk and in every different kind of organization so we can't just have one foot, one size fits all in terms of collegiate mm. recovery because if you take it to from Birmingham to Teesside, it'll be a whole different uh, administrative setup, bureaucracy, uh, just the culture of those different cities is different. Um, so yeah, it needs to we need to develop a truly kind of representative and inclusive movement 
that can act as a framework for all these different cool things that you can hang on it. Could be it could be some amazing, just alternative and innovative uh, programs in in who knows Bristol, something very different happening in Bristol than Edinburgh, and then you know we all come together to create this this uh, wonderful knowledge base and hub mm. of recovery um, in in the UK. Yeah, I do. I do. I worry. I do worry. You say that. I do worry a bit about the twelve-step fellowship because even though I think it is, from my personal experience and what I've learned, is that it's it it seems to run very minimally in what it could be, and I don't think that. Mm. But it also does incredibly well with that minimal, what it could be. But I think sometimes the traditions that that have been set, I don't think they could have imagined what the future was going to hold in terms of, you know, where we're at, understanding the brain and technology and stuff like that. And it kind of makes me wonder that if it doesn't get its groove on a little bit, that it's just going to fade away because there's going to be so much better things that's going to include everything they do. And, and, and instead of it just being that 2%, you, you're going to get into that 98%. 98% as well. I uh, don't know if you had any thoughts along them lines. Well, um, my gosh, yeah, that it, it is a huge uh, subject. I still think that there is something utterly radical, completely amazingly pragmatic, uh, that is a kind of, and I'm using kind of academic language for this really, but it's a kind of technology that the... Um, that the 12 steps happened upon. Uh, of course, it doesn't belong exclusively to 12 step recovery. The notion that there is something inherently problematic with the human conception of a self. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Bill and Bob and the first hundred members came across uh, a lot of these technologies or learnings that had, that had happened in culture before but for me in my own personal recovery they are indispensable um these these notions are the crucial difference between my own personal recovery being utterly self-propelled and having being honest about the experience of how that occurred in my life before compared to the this is the the kind of technological bit really i know it sounds strange to call it a technology but in Academia, sometimes you use that word to indicate new and novel approaches that come through learning and research to bridge gaps. Now, the, the, you know, the, 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 the gap that was bridged there, the technology of, of the spiritual element of recovery is so, it's, it's, you know, that 2% that you speak about, it is just the foundation on that level that I need to look from outside of myself for a solution to this problem and open my experience up to this notion of transcendence of, of, of higher power in my life. So I think, you know, the 12 steps has absolutely nailed that and it's mm. become indispensable. It's part of the DNA of recovery, whether we like it or not, you cannot leave it out. It is, you know, looking at a kind of DNA strand, it's a crucial element of that. You can't really take it out of the evolution process now. It needs to be yeah. there. But I think you're quite right in terms of some of the other stuff that is hardwired into that technology is, um, like many technologies that we look at, kind of has these embedded issues for the future that, that um, are quite clearly kind of there. You can see them there. You know, and... and the most current example of that, I guess, is likely to be the issue of identity politics and how the 12, 12 steps meets the um, meets the challenge of uh, looking at the different identities that are evolving in human society currently, because it does seem that the technology has something quite hardwired into it around gender roles and uh, old school ideas of the family unit 
that being said that is you know the big book is 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 um it's fascinating in the you know it's the kind of genesis of the whole project of the 12 steps written when it was written um but it's in the discussion that we have about it in our big book studies and and one-to-one -one with our fellows that we're able to kind of talk through the differences that are in the book uh without having to necessarily change the book and that's part of the discursive process of recovery mm. and you know it's it's a fascinating process it's different from a lot of other ways of learning because it's like look we've got this kind of book which is an amazing document but you know if you need to talk about what you don't agree in it then we're here for that let's talk about it mm. you know yeah uh, and i think they and, say it's like you know i think i think <laughs> So the people they throw the bath water out of the baby. So over the years, I've kind of sort of seen that. that yeah. And again, tried to explain this to um, in professional circles because whenever you represent the twelve steps, you can guarantee if you're in a room full of mm. twenty professionals, the one of the first three is going to go. You're always not the only way. Which again, I understand what mm. you're saying, <laughs> but these principles mm. that are embedded in this. Mm. That, that, for example, you know, if you've got resentment, then forgiveness is going to be necessary. So if your program doesn't contain some form of forgiveness, it can be Christian, Buddhist, Granny Smith. It doesn't matter what kind of forgiveness it is, but that is indispensable to the treatment of most of these people. So to say it's not the only way, it's you're focusing too much on the dispenser not what it's actually dispensing and the principles i think are indispensable but the the, mm. the 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 alcoholics anonymous itself is is a dispenser of universal principles which again i i think they've nailed it and i and i still haven't found anything simpler if you could just take away a lot of the issues that people have with the actual dispenser which ultimately like we said at the beginning was sort of upper class uh, American sort of Christians of the 1930s but if you can get past all of that which again I was lucky enough to be uneducated so when people were going oh this book was written by you know middle class and I'm like how do they know that I, I couldn't I didn't have the education to, to have a, to understand what they were saying to me it was just these 12 steps these 12 principles that if I try and apply them to my experience that they were going to help me find a power greater than myself, which, again, doesn't have to be a god or anything like that, but just I can't afford to be stuck in this, 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 I don't even want to say unhealthy self, but there's a there's, there's something, again, I'd call it closed-minded. I can't be afford to be closed-minded. It just doesn't go well for me. I don't enjoy that closed-minded space. It, it, it turns me into something I don't want to be. Uh, and getting my mind open again, which this program seems to work wonderfully in helping me to prevent and to uh, to resolve when I do fall into that space through whatever reason. Yeah, mate, we're yeah. uh, we're yeah, that, we're you know. go ahead, mate. Say what you're going to say there. Uh, what was I going to say there, Lester? <laughs> It's just that yes, delay. Um, There's a bit of a delay. Yeah. It's a bit hard work. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it is. It's a, it's a bit of an awkward one. No, really, just to echo that um, that no matter what happens with um, recovery ideology uh, technology, this this simple notion really that uh, there is an element of uh, there's actually a kind of moral element to recovery as well that the biological and um, psychological and psychiatric world will never be comfortable with but that we are able to talk about that actually um, there is morality involved you know we, we take a, a fearless and thorough moral inventory now you can't imagine that in in uh in any kind of new psychotherapeutic... Who's to dictate, who's to dictate uh, <laughs> what the morals are as well, isn't it? It's, well, uh, yeah, that, you know... That, that becomes the intellectual problem. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
But yeah, we could we could talk about it literally until the cows come home, Lester. So I'm not gonna go open no, up a whole another, new rabbit hole. It's another pod, it's another podcast. <laughs> but some yeah. good stuff, and uh, yeah. we're coming up to two hours, so uh, I'm, I'm aware of the time. But um, mate, it's been fascinating talking to you. And I absolutely appreciate what yeah. you're saying. Appreciate your time, and yeah. Uh, it's been mind blowing, actually. Again, I've got so much to think about and consider, and it is almost a, brings a joy to me heart being a twelve stepper, you know, and acknowledging these some of these problems that I've I've kind of come to them conclusions over my period of time in this time industry that we're in, and seeing that you know that, that there's a, there is a chance that this stuff can be addressed because beyond all of the difficulties. You know, we found something very important that set us free, for whatever the difficulties are in it, and how other people might find it uncomfortable. There's definitely something there that's very important to a lot of people, and it has been to my life. And it, it is a bit heartbreaking sometimes when you don't feel quite heard, just trying to express what we found, and then again trying to express it through that dispenser of the 12th step which i kind of love i mean i've got issues with it as well but but it's a shame that that becomes a bit of a bit of a blocker so you know the important thing is is that that people get set free from such a horrible mental condition that uh that plagues a lot of people and again i think you know with the universities again maybe for another time but you just wonder how much in ingrained fear there is about addiction because it is such a massive problem in our society and i mean addiction and mental health is probably two of well among the biggest problems in our society that that probably need to be addressed for any more evolution to uh to happen for yeah. us but, um so it's a fascinating subject just before uh is there anything else you think that you'd like to say before we before we go, that we may have missed, that we don't know about? Well, you know, I think there's there's call for um, for podcasts in the future, um, yeah, time permitting. Uh, but no, you know, really, really uh, happy to have spoken to you today, Lester, and, and to uh, share some of our experiences uh, along this uh, road that can often feel... Um, a little bit lonely uh, for those people that are beginning to kind of question and look for new ways. So it's always nice to talk to someone who's openly saying, um, look, I, I, I really want to explore how we can push recovery forward in this country. And, and uh, mm. you know, it, it's good to meet a fellow, a fellow traveler on that, on that it's, path. It's time, mate. And if you don't mm. mind, we'll, get back to you uh, when you've got some time and do some more podcasts and some of the other subjects. Just one little quick thing that's on my mind. I'd just like to get a little insight because, you know, they made that Noz, mm. that uh, laughing gas, illegal today. Yeah. I'm just wondering, mm. is that part of the experience of people in the university? Oh, yeah. Gosh, yes. Um, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the canisters... The uh, little metal canisters, ubiquitous around the university campus and the the the, the parts of Birmingham that that students frequent. Um, yeah, the the. I mean, I, I I first came across it in in Amsterdam. I lived in Amsterdam for a while, and you used to have the balloon man. You'd come around on a bike <laughs> with uh, nitrous oxide in balloons around the kind of clubbing district. But now, again, you see, it's it's it's. Uh, it's the kind of the the economics of um, of the model of how those young people get that substance. You know, it's all tuned in such a way to make um, a business model that works. Um, and I, I believe that they, you know they they buy these canisters wholesale from you know particular. Um, areas of of the internet and they previously had done you know in a legal way 
where there is a market, capitalism as a kind of entity, you know, just thrives uh, in, in creating the product and the availability. So, that, you know, that technology is the technology we're up against uh, as a society. And as you say, you know, addiction is probably the number one issue uh, that highlights what's going wrong in the lives of communities, economic macro systems and everything. We, we, uh, the, the, the culture of dependence is absolutely is widespread. So these recovery models and technologies need to to, to, to frankly kind of open up about that. The laughing gas being made uh, illegal, um, you know, is that gonna, is that gonna solve the problem? No, absolutely not, you know. And again, we need, we need a grown up policy that looks at the spectrum and continuum of, um, of the, uh, of addiction and recovery. We need people to be alive for them to recover you know, mm. I I wouldn't be here today. I'm sure I, I wouldn't be here today without without clean one mil needles and uh, and and a methadone program uh, at a point in my life. I wouldn't be here, Lester. I'd, I'd be brown mm. bread. There's no no question about it. But um, the fact that those two worlds can't talk to each other and see what they have in common now. And, and, and fall into their quite often petty little uh, political ideologies uh, and, and bicker back and forth in order to gain the favour of commissioners and council um, is, is, is utterly tragic because um, there is a way of doing the continuum of harm minimisation into recovery in a grown up, joined up way that recognises keeping someone parked on a methadone script for longer than a year is kind of against their human rights, to be honest with you. It's terrible. Based yeah. on what kind of system? Yeah. So, yeah, again, I, I veer off, but yeah, the, the debate of, of legislation around substances is so reactionary and based on uh, quite naive political ideologies quite often um and uh ed always has a good way of putting this um that that we kind of we instead of looking for what the common enemy is uh we kind of circle each other and shoot inwards anyone involved with with um with this this world of addiction and recovery is fraught with this toxic debate around um, harm reduction and recovery. It's almost the equivalent of um, two-party politics of, of Labour and Conservatives. Oh, I call it the Catholics uh, and the Protestants. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, even more <laughs> embedded, yeah. Us, us being the Protestants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, mate, yes, appreciate mate. you, mate. Really do appreciate your time. Really appreciate your uh, okay. very, very interesting, and um, definitely be getting back to you. So, cheers, Luke. Thanks very much, yeah. and, uh, cool. and God bless nice you. One, God bless you.